Good morning, church. We're going to read uh, Genesis chapter 32, uh, verses 22 to the end of the chapter, verse 32. God's word. Uh, The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had, and Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket. And Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what's your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and you have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed, Penuel limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. You can be seated. God's word. Uh, This morning, um, we will discuss an event in the life of Jacob that will not only change him indelibly, but will mark and define him for the rest of his life on earth. This is the famous wrestling match between God in human form and Jacob, and something will be transferred in this moment that will reverberate all the way to the cross on Calvary. But before we go there at the end of our sermon, the question is, how did we get here? We're jumping over a couple of chapters in Jacob's life that will continue to reveal his struggle to find his identity in God. And so what I'm gonna do is recap his life and include the missing information. As always, please test the uh, error and the word up here that could have error with it, with the word that's in your hand. In other words, make sure you read your Bible. Uh, Jacob was born as a twin to imperfect but God-fearing and loving parents. In Rebekah's womb, we surmise, and other scripture tells us, that Jacob is trying to supplant his brother's place in the birth order in a wrestling match in the womb, in utero. Esau, the stronger brother, wins that battle, arrives first in the world, and Jacob arrives second, clinging to the heel of his brother. Now, right away, how you view this event earlier in Genesis uh, will inform your view of Jacob moving forward. So, yes, Esau is physically stronger, but Jacob has intense inner strength, doesn't he? We would say today, drive, inner drive. He's marked by not giving up. He's marked by refusing to cede the victory even when he's beaten. He's given a name because of this, Jacob, which means heel grabber, supplanter, wrestler, deceiver. In Hebrew, it's all of them. Later, he takes advantage of his hungry brother and gets him to despise or give up his birthright for a simple bowl of stew. We may protest because it is not fair. It was wrong and it was mean, but also smart, determined, driven. Again, later, he works with his mom in his corner to outsmart his brother and deceive his aging and blinding father. Jacob pretends to be his brother and deceives his father intimately in a dark tent to receive the words of life from his dad. So now you see that Jacob has burned through both men in his life. His father Isaac banishes him from the camp for that intimate deception. His brother Esau says in the scripture, and I quote, isn't he rightly named Jacob? For he has deceived me twice. The Bible says in that moment Esau hated Jacob, and as soon as dad died, he planned to come, to, and he promised to kill Jacob. Jacob therefore flees to a land where he has an uncle, oh, Uncle Laban. And last week we talked about the new wrestling match with this third man in his life, Laban. Now Laban seems to have the upper hand in this wrestling match because he offloads the daughter that has lesser human value than nobody wants and also the daughter of greater value for 14 years of free labor. But Jacob does get four wives out of the deal. And now you have to ask, well, who is this Jacob? Who is he? 
and, and, and who he is is a sinful and spiraling patriarch. In other words, notice this. Abraham, the father of faith, sleeps with a maidservant once out of desperation and his wife's uh, command to do so and out of barrenness, and God disciplines him uh, severely. Isaac, his son, is faithful to Rebekah and Rebekah only. Jacob sleeps with four women, even though there's only one instance of desperation on Rachel's part. But there is no barrenness in the family. All of the other patterns of infidelity that come in his home come because of jealousy that he's created in the home. Leah, and we'll get this on the screen so you can see them all, Leah has four boys, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And then Rachel says, please, I have to have a child. So he, you know, okay. So he sleeps with Bilhah, her maidservant, and he gets two more sons, Dan and Naphtali. Then he sleeps with Zilpah and gets two more sons, which is Leah's maidservant, Gad and Asher. And then back to Leah, because anything you can do, I can do better. And Leah has two more sons, Issachar and Zebulun, and then a daughter, Dinah. Finally, Rachel has a child, a boy, and she names him Joseph. Now, if you're counting, that's 11 boys and one girl. So, if you know the story of Jacob, he has no physical or intimate relationship with any woman in his life until he's 84 years old. But then he has 12 children by four different women in the span of about seven years. He makes up for lost time. When he has Joseph, he knows then it's time to go back to, to home. Right? Why? Now, why does he use that birth to say, okay, now it's time to go back? Because now he has in his mind the son of promise. Because Rachel is his choice. That's the one that I love. And therefore, her son is Jacob's choice for the inheritance. Jacob has learned through his life that the, the last can be first. The, the birth order doesn't matter. That's why he's chosen the younger daughter of Laban, which he should not have, and now he chooses the last son to receive his birthright. If you remember a long time ago when we talked about Laban, uh, when the, the Abraham servant came to get Rebekah, uh, there was this standoff, I said, at the OK Corral, um, and, and, and Laban and his mom didn't really want uh, Rebekah to leave, and it was hard to go. And, and therefore, you see, the Bible's consistent. We get a nature or a character of Laban because for Laban, giving something and letting something go are two different things for him. He's given his daughters, but he does not want Jacob to go because now he views all of them as part of his clan. This is La Familia, right? This is Hotel California. You can check in anytime you want, but you can never leave. There are reasons for this. And mainly we see this in our world today because Laban is greedy and, and he, he's smart and he doesn't want the, the God of Jacob. He doesn't want the truth of Jacob. He doesn't want the structure uh, that comes with a God who's over his life. He just wants the stuff that Jacob has. He's no dummy. So Jacob works six more years, and in that time he does some strange things to manipulate animals so that he prospers more and all the time he's being detained. By the way, all of this, and we'll mention it again, is a foreshadowing of Egypt. When the Jacobites, right, the Israelites, will be detained, not allowed to leave, because the Bible says they're too valuable to Pharaoh. He doesn't care about their God. He cares about their produce, the, the things that they do for him. And we have the same thing here, Laban foreshadowing the Pharaoh. You cannot leave. Jacob is in a pinch for sure, but I want you to know that in the Bible, when we get in these pinches, there is an honest way out. You can't be a person of integrity. You can't stand before somebody and says, I don't care what you do. I'm leaving. God has told me to leave. I'm going to leave. Abraham's servant showed the way, and we talked about that. Moses will later confirm that way of how to be honest and get out of town. Jacob does a very Jacob thing. He sneaks away in the middle of the night during the shearing season so that Laban didn't even discover the trickery for three days. The Bible does not look kindly upon this act. As chapter 31, verse 20 says, and Jacob tricked Laban, Jacob, Jacob Laban, the Aramean, by not telling him that he intended to flee. That's not very honest, is it? Understandable? Yes. Not honest. So it looks like Jacob has now burned through his third man, and his third man bridge, I think, that he needed. 
father, brother, and now uncle, whew, gone. Uh, there's not a, a relationship in the life of Jacob, actually, when I thought about it, that we know of anyway, that's healthy. And I want to put this up here so you see it. The men in his life, he burns through. The women are bound to his dysfunction, and even the animals are manipulated for his gain. And the question over the text is, does this look like Adam, the first man? Does this look like flourishing, taking care of everything around you so that everything flourishes around you? Does this look, how can this ever be someone who becomes in any form the imago Dei, the image of God, and therefore witness to the world what health looks like? And so therefore, because he looks nothing like that man, what happens next makes all the sense in the world. And that brings us closer to our text today. God is going to come into his life and break him. God will hurt him. God will be his enemy until Jacob becomes his friend. But I also want to back away now from the text and tell you there's even a different view here. And I want to actually thank a, a dear sister in Christ for texting me earlier uh, this week and alerting me to her heart for another side of Jacob that has been more hidden for me for whatever reason. Jacob is wounding everybody, but she was able to see that Jacob has also been wounded. And this is why it's important to mention her coloring of the text. Because in the world we live in, when everyone is so anxious to find the one person or even the one system where we can unload all of our fury over a broken world and we point at and we claim superiority and we place blame upon that, we've truly missed the gospel in its, in its fullness. Whenever you find yourself in a crowd with pitchforks and posters, it's not a Christian crowd. Miroslav Wolf said this, Forgiveness flounders because I exclude the enemy from the community of humans, even as I exclude myself from the community of sinners. But no one can be in the presence of the God of the crucified Messiah for long without overcoming this double exclusion, without transposing the enemy from the sphere of the monstrous into the sphere of shared humanity, and oneself from the sphere of proud innocence into the sphere of common sinfulness. Do you see that? Do you see the struggle in our world to do that? And so this wonderful sister in Christ, her gentle reminder to me, not as a correction, but for added color, was to challenge me to see Jacob with the same grace-filled eyes that I saw Leah last week. And she was right to add that commentary because Jacob is not only somebody who is propagating sin and brokenness, he's a product of it, as we all are. All have sinned, the Bible says, and fall short of the glory of God, which means that all of us have broken the hearts of others because all of us are products of brokenness. Look again at Jacob. He's not just breaking his family through sinful favoritism. He's doing that, yes, but he's also a product of it. How many times had he possibly silently cried that he was the, the boy that dad didn't want? The boy that didn't light the eyes of his fathers, not quite as strong, not quite as robust, not quite as capable in what his culture defined as masculinity. Jacob is wounding because he carries a primal wound himself. His father, the Bible says, heartbreakingly loved Esau. So that Jacob not only has burned through the only three men in his life, I think it's fair to say that they also burned through him. Dad looked the other way at the more attractive one. Esau looked over him, and Laban abuses and uses him. Now, having said that, because some of you will take the, okay, so what are you saying about our world today? This doesn't let Jacob off the hook. It lets nobody off the hook when it comes to sin. Sin is sin. We're all responsible for our action. But it sure should keep us and all of the rest of us from pointing fingers as if to say, you're the sin. If you want to cancel sin in our culture, you have to do a disappearing act yourself. Amen? So seeing Jacob with eyes of grace will also, now let me come back to the story, give us a view of what God is coming to do. So remember I said God is coming to break him and hurt him? Yes, but now if you see the other side, you see that God is also coming to what? Heal him. And by the way, those two things are not at odds with one another. The God who's breaking and hurting is hurting and breaking to heal. 
Those things go hand in hand. So let's kind of move into our text today. Laban chases after Jacob and his family, and the Bible hints that he's coming to kill him, and we know that because God intervenes and tells Laban, do not harm him. Um, So they meet, and what happens essentially in the text is they yell at each other. But Laban is not going to win the yelling match. He's not going to be able to convince him to come back. He's not going to be able to convince him to bring his daughters back, and those are his grandchildren, right? Jacob is going to go. He says, I'm going. So Laban has no choice. This would have been the honest thing to do anyway, so God makes that happen. They covenant together over a pile of rocks and a boundary marker. And they promise to not cross that barrier into each other's land and surely not to harm one another. Okay, so we see what God's doing. Now one man problem is down, and now Jacob turns and sets his eyes on Esau. And this is where the tension builds in the text. He has a marker behind him signifying that path is gone. There's a tenuous covenant there, but the life with Laban is over. He must move the other way back into Canaan. He knows it because he has Joseph, even though that's wrong, and, but he also knows it because God tells him to go. And now he must move south or west, southwest to face Esau. But the problem is, and what I want to bring you attention to, is the last time we saw Esau, the last time he saw Esau, Esau said he was going to kill him. It's clear in the text that Jacob is afraid. It's also clear in the text that Jacob knows that the wrath of Esau is not unwarranted. That's important for us, though. Jacob knows that he's not in the right. Some people color that scene and say, well, he had to steal the blessing, right? No, Jacob doesn't feel that way. Jacob feels that he must appease Esau because he's in the wrong. And so Jacob does, again, a very Jacob thing. He sends a bunch of messengers towards Seir, and if they get killed, that's fine. But the messengers, what they're going to say is they're going into the land of Esau with news to Esau that, yes, your brother's coming, and he's really rich. That's what he tells them. Uh, uh, Animals by the hundreds, males and female slaves, and the message to Esau is, brother, I'm rich, so I'm, I'm useful to you, right? So just so you know, don't hurt me because I have a lot of stuff. The messengers come back after that trip and say, yeah, we told him that you were coming and you were rich, and he didn't wait. He's coming to meet you. And oh, by the way, he's bringing 400 men. (laughs) So the response in the text in Hebrew, if you kind of get in the context, is Esau saying, I don't care if you're rich. I'm powerful. And by the way, I think I'll come and kill you and take whatever I want because it belongs to me anyway. Now, you're saying, well, the scripture doesn't say that, but it does. <laughs> because if you know the text, you know that the whole issue here, what the Hebrew is trying to tell you is that Esau is coming with an army. He's not coming with his family. He's not coming with animals. He's not coming with slaves. He's not coming with anything else. He's com- with wives and children. He's coming with warriors. And he's not waiting, which means he's anxious to get this done. He's on his way. And now Jacob's fears have been so heightened that it goes into full-blown panic. His plan didn't work. The scripture says this, 32-7, when he hears this news that Esau's on his way, it says, then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. That's how he feels when he gets the news. In Hebrew, those words mean that he's overcome with dread, and this weird distressed word means, and he's cramped. We would say today that his heart dropped in his stomach. This is bad, bad, bad news. Esau is coming to kill him. Man. By the way, you know how this feels. This is the call from the doctor, inoperable. This is the note from the spouse, I'm in love with somebody else. This is the visit from the policeman, Mr. and Mrs. Logan, I'm sorry, there's been a crash. This is a letter from a lawyer. And at this point, Jacob is done. He's afraid, and his heart drops in his stomach, and he realizes there's no escape. Now, at this point, the question is, when this happens, some of you right away are like, man, I'm hitting my knees. Did Jacob hit his knees? Did he build an altar? Did he pray in his brokenness and reach out to God? No, because Jacob isn't ready to give up. Instead, the schemer schemes. He will plan his way out of this issue. So he does these things, and we'll put them on the screen so you see his planning. The first thing he does is he breaks his camp into two camps. Now, what does that mean? The Bible tells you what he's thinking. He's like, okay, so if he attacks the first camp, what happens? I will have time to get the second camp, so I'm cutting my losses. 
And then after he does that, he tries to manipulate or control God. Now, it does not say that he prays to God. The word uses there is that he goes and he commands God. And this is his prayer. You can read it in chapter 32, but his prayer is, God, you told me to come back into Canaan. This is on you. Please, and he says, please deliver me because you said you would. You said I'd be blessed. You said my offspring would be a multitude. And the question is, what is Jacob doing? And what it's clear that he's doing is he's trying to get the upper hand on God. He's trying to control God with a contract. God, you said, and, and by the way, I'll raise my hand. Any of you been like this in fear? God, you said, you said, you're trying to figure out how to change the bad news by, by grabbing God and forcing him to do something. You promised. And then, so after he does that, then he tries to squeeze God. After he does that, he, he takes his animals. And by the way, the Bible says, I'll mention 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 lambs, 20 rams, 30 milking camels and calves, 40 female cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, 10 male donkeys. That's a lot. If you count, I counted them up, 550 animals. And he separates them by types and he spreads them out and he marches them towards the coming army of Esau. Smart, isn't it? Jacob tells us in the scripture that he is sending gifts, but the word in Hebrew is sacrifice, an offering to Esau. Because it says in verse 20, he's hoping to appease or pay back Esau. So now, are you in his mind? See, this is Jacob's thinking. Okay, I've stole your blessing. Let me pay it back. You can have all my wealth. I'll send them to you. And as you keep going through these waves of wealth, you'll be appeased. It belongs to you. Just don't kill me and my family. So it's almost as if he's run out of ideas. It looks like he's done everything he can to protect his life. It's, it's right there where he can't think of another idea. And at the last second, he thinks of one more. And he moves his immediate family back across the river, Yobok. This would have been a river that's probably flowing well and hard to cross. And he gets them back across. So, see his thinking? So that even if all the, the animals are taken and Esau isn't appeased, even if Esau comes in and kills all of camp one, and then they capture all of camp two and kills them, and even if they all die, at least his family will escape back to Laban, back where they didn't think they would go, because they've already crossed that difficult river, and it would be really hard for Esau to cross with his men and catch them in the middle of the night. So now the Bible wants you to know that he's done. He can't sleep. He's hemmed in on all sides. He has no more ideas. By the way, a crisis of faith, which I don't think everybody has to go through, but it's really important for people that are unwilling to break to go through a crisis of faith. And so you ask, if you ask the question, what is a crisis of faith for somebody who's a planner when there are no more plans? Now he doesn't know what to do. The enemy is behind him. The enemy is ahead of him. And all of his scheming and all of his planning and all of his brokenness is being squeezed into this one moment. But Jacob is still not giving up. He will not trust God to be his God. He refuses to believe and this is what all of us must come to, I believe, for salvation. He refuses to believe that having God for God alone is enough. That God himself is the blessing for us. Because God is. And Jacob's lack of submission to the Lord of the garden and his constant struggle for securing the garden of the Lord. The, in other words, he wants the blessing and not the blessor. He wants the gifts and not the giver. This lack of crucial identity work is a challenge to the very presence of God in his life. Because no trust means no submission. No submission means no presence. No presence means no future. No future means no hope for any of us, let alone Jacob. Jacob has followed God because God has been useful. But God doesn't want to be useful. God wants to be healer, lover, Lord, creator. Not because God has a huge ego, but because God loves Jacob. He wants to heal Jacob because through Jacob, a nation will come that can heal the nations from this poison that runs inside of us. So how is, how is God going to do that when Jacob refuses to be healed? 
See, the Bible is showing us that we're not automatons. God chooses us, but we have to choose him back. If Jacob doesn't love Leah and Leah doesn't love Jacob, what happens? They carry on in family dysfunction. If Isaac doesn't love Jacob and Jacob doesn't love Isaac, there's brokenness, but they adapt and they move on. It's not a death blow. But if God doesn't love Jacob and Jacob doesn't love God, there's no hope. It's death, and that's true for you. Eternal separation, void, darkness, chaos, primordial goo. We need God more than we need water, sun, and food. I can go three days without water if I have God because he's more important. There's another life beyond this one. So the, the question over the scripture and what Jacob is dealing with that his father's dealt with is, do you want to be eternal? Do you want to burn out like a candle? Do you want to disappear like the steamy mist above a cup of coffee? Do you want to grow like a blade of grass and die away in a day? Or do you want to be who you're made to be, eternal in my kingdom, loved and ruling with me over the nations? If Jacob is eternal, if Jacob knew this, he could have lost his animals. He could even lose his wife and kids. He could even lose his own life. Why? Because he's eternal. But Jacob refuses, or he's unable, to do this sacred internal identity work. So... When all of the options are out and Jacob still refuses to to, uh, bend to God, it's at this point that God, I think, kind of looks at one of his angels and says, here, hold my beer. Now, for all of you Baptists, it it was here, hold my uh, sparkling grape juice, right? But he's like, that's it. I'm coming in. God's going to get involved physically in order to get Jacob to tap out. In the Hebrew text, the Jewish people would have been alerted to this play on words that would have heightened the tension in the text. We weren't alerted to it because we're English speakers, but I want you to see the Hebrew. Yaakov, the man, is next to the Yaabok, the river, and another man comes into Yaabach, wrestle, Jacob. Three words that are different forms of the name Jacob and describing facets in his personality. The heel grabber is going to be wrestled by a man next to a place of being laid waste. For a, Jew, for a Jewish person, they loved the play on words. They would see that Jacob's entire life is being squeezed in this moment. In every way that he's been inwardly wounded, in every way that he has laid waste the heart and wounded others, for every deception, every bit of trickery, every scheme to get ahead, it's now all coming back to him in a place he can't escape. Again, And I think it's clear this is a foreshadowing of the nation, his nation someday, that will be hemmed in at the Red Sea, surrounded by mountains, and they must finally trust God for deliverance. Now, we are told little about what happens next. It's actually very mysterious and quick. We just learned from the Bible in the beginning that it is a man, right, who sneaks into his space in the middle of the night and attacks him. Now, we get the idea that Jacob thinks it is a man, and therefore he thinks it must be a mercenary from Esau. Esau himself, maybe, but somebody has been sent in to kill him. The Bible says, or makes it clear, that in this wrestling match, he can't get away. He tries to break free, but he can't. This man will have none of it. He must fight this man. Jacob won't submit because submission means death, right? That's what you feel like. If you're fighting for your life, you can't submit because he'll kill you. And in the most pregnant way I can say these words, Jacob is literally fighting for his life. Think about that. He's literally fighting for a life. There's mud and rocks and water and grunts. Neither man can get the upper hand. The stranger who is a man in the text still cannot be beaten. Jacob will refuse to lose. In human form, the stranger has met his match, has met his equal. So he strikes Jacob's hip socket and cripples Jacob. By the way, for the rest of his life, crippled. The, main, the, the pain must have been excruciating because at that point, Jacob realizes that this is no mere man. And so as he cries out in pain, he realizes this is a divine person. This is an angel. And so with the same strength that he has been exerting to keep this killer at bay, he now uses that same strength to keep him close. Jacob may be beat, but he still refuses to let go. 
in the best way here. All of Jacob's life has been wrestling others, and we realize now he's been wrestling others for what only the Lord could give him. And he realizes it now. The divine stranger, now that we know it's a divine stranger, but still maybe just an angel, the stranger says, let me go. And Jacob cries out, not until you bless me. Hmm. The Hebrew word there for bless means fill me with strength or adore me. Isn't this what Jacob has always wanted? Not until you adore me. Give me value. Fill my heart with something that lets me know that I'm worthy. So the divine man says, what's your name? <laughs> Isn't that a crazy question when somebody says, adore me? And now Jacob must admit who he is. Knowing that Esau is on his way to kill him, he's emotionally wasted. He's out of schemes, so means he's mentally wasted, and now he's physically wasted. In every way, he's laid waste at the river called Laid Waste. And now finally, Jacob finally, finally, finally gives in. And he gives in with the words, I am Jacob. I am the heel grabber. I am the deceiver. His name is an indictment, a burning embarrassment. I am the supplanter. I am the cheat. I am the sinner. I'm Jacob. And God says, no more, son. Listen to him. No more, son. You're now Israel. For you have fought the God who fights, and you have prevailed. And the word prevailed means you have endured, and it means you have comprehended. Now you know. Remember when I've said this before, whenever God asks you a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. Okay? So what, what is your name is a counseling question. And when Jacob admits who he is, he can move into his healing, and the same is true of you. It's in admitting our brokenness that we're able to move into our healing. And Jacob now has everything that every Christian must have if they hope to move and breathe in a world of sinners who sin and brokenhearted humans who use and break the hearts of others because we have that world today. And what must you have? A new identity in God. And now this new man can arise. And if he had been that man, he could have stood before Laban and he could have told him, I'm leaving I don't know what you're going to do about it, but God told me to leave, so I'm leaving tomorrow morning. Now he can face his father, and every boy here knows that you can face your father finally and no longer need the face of his approval. Your father can't hurt you anymore because you have a new one. Now he can face the gathering storm of Esau and the storm of fury, and he can even lose everything because everything is nothing in the light of what he has found in the face of his creator. He is now a person of weight himself. And the Bible wants us to know that God sees Hagar and God sees Leah, and you better believe God sees Jacob as well. We now know that this is God himself, by the way, in human form. It finally allows us to know at the end. God won't give Jacob his name. Jacob is saying, what's your name, what's your name? God won't give it. He'll reserve that blessing for a different person named Moses. God disappears. We assume he disappears before Jacob can see his face in the light of day. For as Exodus 33 says, no one sees God's face and lives. Jacob still names the place Peniel, which means the face of God. The face of God in the dark. Now, what else happens to Jacob? Let's just conclude this story because a lot happens here. He gets up from this wrestling match and he, you see he's a different man. He goes up in front and he goes to meet his brother because he's willing to die. And instead, his brother hugs him and cries with him. He also erects a altar. Jacob has done this many times, by the way. If you look through every scripture beforehand where Jacob has erected an altar, you'll see that he erects it to the God of my father Abraham and Isaac, to the God of my father Abraham and Isaac, to the God of my father Abraham and Isaac. 
the first altar that he ever erected where he says, this altar is to the God, the God of me. He's done his work, hasn't he? Now, as we conclude, and, and by the way, one more thing I, I need to share. When it comes to the, because we can jump ahead to Hebrews and we see the hall of faith. You've heard of that, right? Hebrews chapter 11, where by faith, by faith, by faith. You know what it's going to say? I think it's in verse 21 of chapter 11. I might be wrong, but in Hebrews it says, by faith, Jacob blessed Joseph's sons while leaning on his staff in worship. What, why say that? Why would, why would the Bible care to say that he's leaning on his staff? Because the Bible wants you to know that Jacob's worship, who he is, is completely tied to his crippling. And so is yours. Now, there are implications. Let's talk about these as we conclude. Three implications. One is for the nation. The nation of Israel, forget you for a minute. They will get their identity from this man, from this encounter, this new name, everything about him, they will get their sight in. They will be known for trickery and deception. They will also be known for their gritty stubbornness, for their stiff neckedness, God would say. They will fight with God, and God will fight with them, and God will fight for them. This is the struggle of Israel. It's the struggle of Jacob. They will strive with God, and they will prevail, but it comes at a great cost for God. The story of the Old Testament is God loving them like he loved Jacob, but they will not love him back. So something must be done. In the end, God pays the price for that. The New Testament church, now let's talk about you and I. We'll also, we will get our identity from, the, from not only this event, but for the event that this is foreshadowing at the cross. God will come down again and seemingly in human form wrestle in a match with humanity. Now, if you look at Calvary, isn't it too simplistic to say that God lost at Calvary because he died? He also won. Isn't it also too simplistic to say that humanity lost at Calvary? When we crucified the Christ, did we lose? It's too simplistic. We also won. Just like this wrestling match, there's a divine, holy, mysterious paradox at the cross that requires, I keep telling all y'all, a lifetime of reflection at the cross is your goal. Paul says, that's all I desire to know. For the rest of my life, it's Christ and him crucified. I'm trying to understand that. Live there. Jacob secures the blessing of God, a new name, through the grasping spirit that God was seeking to redeem and heal. Later, Peter will say that our sin that actually crucified the Messiah was the sin, the means through which God brought salvation to the nations. Think about that. God doesn't go around our sin. He uses it to redeem it. God uses the very thing that's killing us as, as a means to save us. What an amazing God. Because we, are, we can do nothing else but rebel. And so he says, I'll use that too. And there's more. Finally, there's the personal. Now let me talk to just you and me sitting in these chairs. How are we transformed? And the Bible says there are many ways. You know, I, my growth over the years is I, I used to come to a text like this and I'm like, everybody's got to wrestle. Everybody's got to do this just like Jacob. But we've seen three different patriarchs now. And there is a way to be transformed either gently, like Isaac. Isaac, he taps out quick. Done. You get it. Done. Right? No, I'm not fighting. Uh, and he's transformed. You can also be transformed through scary tests like Abraham, who was a little more stronger willed. Or you can take the strongest willed patriarch of all, and you can be transformed through a wrestling match like Jacob. But all of us, all of us, like Jacob, must have a magnificent defeat, as Frederick Beekner calls it. I would like to maybe call it a crippling victory. All of us must have it. You must deal with your God. Our power individually is going to be seen in our weakness. In fact, we have no power without it. We walk with a limp. Our weakness will give us courage to face our world like Jacob. Why? Because we have dealt with God and we have prevailed. 
We've come through. In fact, most Christians I know who I think, boy, they really are Christians, will have something in their life where they say, this worst thing that's ever happened to me is also the best thing that's ever happened to me because there at that wrestling match, I met the Lord, my God. So the question for you today as we end is, have you dealt with your God? That's your question to answer, not mine. How to do that? It's right here in Genesis 32. It's also all through the Old Testament, and it's all through the New Testament, and it's on the cross of Jesus Christ. Two things that I know you have to have is you have to not die, and you have to have a new name. When it says that Jacob wrestled with God and prevailed, what happened? He got up and he thought, oh my gosh, I didn't die. And I got a new name. If you don't want to die forever and you want a new name, you have to go through the Christ to get to the Father. However much that costs you actually depends on your willingness to submit. Even though, I'll say this, even if it costs you dearly, and I'm somebody who's been more like Jacob, cost me dearly to finally tap out. Even if it costs you dearly before you see the face of God, what we learn at the cross is, is that in the wrestling match for humanity, with humanity, it cost him way more than it cost you to give it to you. In that, in that moment, when you look at that event, you see Jesus taking our place, becoming sin for us, losing his name, and crying out from the abyss, God, you've forsaken me. He loses his name and he dies. He does that so that we can live forever and we can see the face of God because we receive his good name. He gives us a name at the cross and he dies in our place. You have work to do, we all do, at the foot of the cross. Go there, tap out, and be lifted again in grace. Let's pray. Dear Father, I pray for a people who will submit to your will, who will be courageous enough, I think, to go to you and wrestle an identity out of you. I'm thankful for an example like Jacob. I've been touched this week by the healing activity in his life that came through a really scary ordeal with you but all under the text of you coming in as an enemy to kill him, what we learn is that if he taps out, you save him. When he's willing to give up and share his identity, you're willing to lift him up from the ground and give him a new name. And Father, we all must deal with you today, or we have dealt with you in the past. So either we come and worship, remembering our moments of getting our hip broken, or we come today, Father, wondering how hard it's gonna be. But I pray that you'll lead our hearts into a Father who loves us so much that he is willing to be our enemy to make us his friend. And we see that on the cross as they yelled at him insults, as they spit at him, as they tore open his back and ripped his forehead with a crown of thorns, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And the moment the forgiveness comes into our lives is the moment we know what we do. And so I pray for a breaking of a people, for a thousand coins to drop into the machine today and for each individual today to, to, to remember, to think, to get it so that we can be raised in new life. Thank you for our time today, Father, to worship you. It's in your name, I pray, amen.